Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We're coming to you live from our massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it is Aaron this week for the intro. It is hard to believe, but another month is behind us, and here we are. It's the end of April. Now, if you will be at Red Hat Summit next week in Denver, both Brian and I will be there, and I'll actually have a speaking session, so please stop by and heckle. No, really, I, I'm begging you, please do. Uh, I pulled the 8.30 a.m. on Thursday, the last day of the show, speaking slot. So all the dinners, all the parties, everything Wednesday night, um, I'm begging you, please, please. Come to my talk. It's on open source AI. And if you're around, I'd love to say hey and talk. So with that, let's move on to cloud news for April. And that's coming up right after this. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. I'm your host, Brian Gracely. And as always, joined by co-host Aaron. Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. And I'm glad we were able to figure out who was going to be the um, host and who is going to be the guest. There you go. <laughs> It's kind of an inside story for, that's right. for everyone. That's right. That's right, man. We are uh, – another month of the year has gone by. Another month of uh, 2024 has, has gone by. We are recording this uh, technically just before uh, the end of April. So if we if we miss anything big the last couple of days. But this is another uh, Cloud News of the Month. Uh, how has your April been so far? It's been really good, really, really busy. I mean, day job, bunch of work travel coming up. I think you're kind of doing the same. I think yep. it's conference season is kind of kicking in for, you know, the day jobs. And it, it's also interesting, like we've got cloud earnings and a bunch of other stuff like that, but it's been a good month. Though. Yeah, no, it's been a good month. I uh, I got to ask you a question before we get into all the technical stuff. So uh, your team and my team, you you are a, a fan of Clemson. I am a, a fan of, of Wake Forest. Our, our teams are both part of the ACC, um, your team for years and years was just sort of average. There was actually a verb that talked about when your team would, would sort of, you know, choke, uh, fail and choke and lose. And uh, they would call it Clemsoning. Um, over the last mm -hmm. last few mm -hmm. years, you've, you've been very good. Um, your, your coach believes that you're a big deal. And now your team has decided to sue our league, uh, that you are, you are too big for our league. And so my question to you is, at what point do you plan to sue the Cloudcast to try and get out of this relationship we have? Do I have to worry <laughs> about that, man? Are you, well, th that assumes there's some money to be made out of this. So, I mean, I, and, until that happens, I don't think we have to worry about it. You're not, uh, you're not, you're not <laughs> taking offers from a uh, rival podcast to leave for, for greener pastures? Not at this time. No. All right. No. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Good. Well, look, uh, let's, uh, let's dive in it, it, you know, looking, looking back at the, uh, cloud news that, you know, looking back at all the cloud news of the week, which you, uh, rigorously keep up with every week. If you're new to the show, um, in the show notes every week, there's something called cloud news of the week. Uh, Aaron does an awesome job of going and scouring the internet and finding all sorts of interesting stories. Um, this show that we do monthly is sort of a, kind of a summary of them, but also then a, a deep dive into some of them. Uh, it's been a it's been a, a busy month. Do you want to uh, start off with our our good old fashioned cloud news? Yeah. So for those that are new to it, I mean, it, there is a certain amount of we want to bubble up the top stories uh, in in cloud that happened, right? And the reason why is because a lot of the AI stories tend to take over a lot of the news feeds these days, for better or worse. Yep. To be really honest with you, but I, I think we should start with uh, cloud earnings. I, I, you know, cloud earnings season is here. And uh, at least two of the public clouds. Uh, That's right. You know, checked yeah, in. Amazon, and Amazon we talk of, about them first. Yeah, Amazon as of as of the day we're recording, which is the twenty sixth, has not announced. I think they come out on Monday, so uh, you know we'll we won't we won't speculate on where they are. But uh, yeah, why don't you start off with uh, with Azure and, and GCP's numbers because they did publish this week. Yeah, absolutely. So. Azure, um, the, the biggest thing for me was, I mean, still growing well, considering how big they are, up 21%. Um, and what they're calling the intelligent cloud was almost $27 billion. Right. Um, and then GCP earnings, up 28% and $9.5 billion as yeah. well. Yeah. So, um, so what was kind of your big highlights in there, though? Because I know you like digging in. Yeah, um, I, especially I think, in the Jordan articles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, shout out to our friend Jordan Nevet who uh, who covers this uh, religiously. Um, you know, I think a couple things popped up. Uh, the things that I saw was, um, you know, they 
Azure people are really speculating about how much, you know, the, you know, they've made such a big investment in things like open AI and some AI stuff. Um, they're trying to pull those numbers out, right? So we've always said that Azure is always the hardest cloud to figure out because they sort of count certain things as cloud and certain uh, things like Office 365 and, you know, some of the, the server stuff. Um, but, but basically people were saying, like, if you've pulled out the AI numbers, um, you know, they were, at least from an infrastructure perspective, uh, looked very, very good this this last quarter. Um, so it it does feel a little bit like um, at least Azure is, is maybe a, a canary in terms of, uh, you know, the, the spending back into cloud as opposed to the, you know, trying to cut back on cost and be optimizing cost may have, we've, maybe we sort of reached that that tipping point a little bit to where people are starting new projects. So um, that'll be interesting to kind of watch. I think on the GCP side, the thing that was interesting is, um, you know, obviously they, they keep growing. They're, they're growing at, you know, slightly higher rates and again, uh, off of smaller numbers. So the rates are, are going to be relative. Um, but, uh, but operating income was up 5X. So they, they did almost a billion dollars. So I think, you know, it was a couple of quarters ago where they first made a uh, dollar of profit after like 10 years or so. Uh, I think this last quarter they did about $150 million in profit. In this uh, last quarter, uh, they did about a billion dollars. So, you know, they are, whether that's through, you know, layoffs or cost cutting or some other things internally, they are figuring out, uh, you know, how to become, how to become more profitable. And I don't know if that means that, you know, they've, they've started to, you know, sort of steady state for all the years of, of, uh, of, you know, spending on sales and marketing, or if, you know, this is, you know, driven by some of the AI stuff, because we've always said they were probably going to be a very, uh, successful AI cloud. Um, but yeah, it's starting to see some, some different things from GCP than we had seen in the past in terms of, uh, especially profitability. So, yeah. Yeah. A little uh, bit of maturity finally. It only yeah. took. Yeah. The other thing, uh, the, the other thing that, that, that caught our eye this last month and, and got both, uh, you know, kind of a couple of headlines, uh, was, was our friends at HashiCorp. So what, uh, what all happened to HashiCorp this last month? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to start with this one, um, the open tofu um, accusations, right? There was, and it's gone into really, really a, a lot of detail in other other podcasts, and it's a lot of bit, a lot has been written out about it. But basically, there were some accusations um, with uh, open tofu and and HashiCorp and code stealing and some other things like that, and that kind of grabbed some headlines for a while, and and then. Uh, HashiCorp, all of a sudden, IBM swoops in. Um, you're, you're, you're big overlords in the day yeah. job, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So $6.4 billion to uh, acquire HashiCorp, and that was just recently announced. But it, here's a quick side uh, to both of those that, you know, this kind of really impacts a lot of folks just in day to day. Um, I'm doing, uh, for, again, for the day job, I'm doing an infrastructure as code talk uh, here in a couple of weeks. And, and it was interesting. I put together my slides and it was like infrastructure as code. And here's some of the tools you use. And it was like Ansible. And then it's like, oh, at the end of the day, owned by IBM. And then it was like um, now HashiCorp and Terraform. Oh, at the end of the day, owned by IBM. And then it was like interesting to see uh, IBM's kind of you know gobbling up, if you will. And not related here, but something else they did recently was they did. Um, I don't know if it was big publicly, but I had some friends that were kind of impacted. They they shrunk down the the consulting side of the IBM business, mm -hmm. and then they're growing the software side of the business. Yeah. So IBM's doing a little bit of right sizing, if you will, and and continuing to grow the pie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and uh, you know, from an IBM perspective, they've. Obviously, they've they've been trying to to be less dependent on on owned consulting, right? They spun off some things to Kindrel, so that, that that probably aligns to that. They've been trying to be more, you know, kind of get back to being more innovative. I, I will say, uh, just and in, in again, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and stay away from any speculation about the HashiCorp stuff uh, again because of my relationship with with Red Hat and IBM. Um, you know, this is a intended to acquire at this point. Uh, you know, as of you know April's. 26th or 25th, whenever this was announced, um, I think IBM said that, you know, their expectation was, you know, given, given all the hurdles that you have to go through for an acquisition, especially of, of this size, um, they expect it to close in, uh, at the end of 2024. So, um, you know, they, they do expect there to be a certain amount of, you know, normal, uh, you know, kind of, uh, things that you have to go through from a regulation perspective and, and, uh, you know, all, all the things across all sorts of different, um, regions and stuff. So, 
you know, while everybody's writing their think piece about HashiCorp, um, they are still an independent entity at this point in time um, until until it closes. So just kind of keep yeah. that in mind for folks. No, agreed. Agreed. Uh, what else? What else you got in the in the good old cloud, uh, good old fashioned cloud news? Yeah, right so let, let's talk about Cisco um, again. I feel like we're talking, we're, we're hitting all of Brian's uh, either current or previous employers here, but uh, Cisco <laughs> launched HyperShield, and I mean the easiest way to think about this is security meets AI, right? Yeah. And I admit I hadn't dug into this one that, that much. Did you get a chance to I dig did, into this? One? I did dig into this a little bit. Uh, some people were talking about it on one of the Slack channels. I think they were talking about it on the. Software Defined Talk Slack channel. I think one of the the people that that's on there um, works for Cisco and was just kind of mentioning it to people. Um, I had a colleague who got briefed on it and, and did a really good write up. Um, this feels like if you've been paying attention to some of the acquisitions that Cisco has made recently. So they they obviously um, spent a lot of my money acquired Splunk here recently. They acquired. Um, kind of a niche networking security company called Isovalent, who is kind of the behind the eBPF technology that if you're really into Linux and networking, you would know about. Um, and they acquired a couple of other companies and, and people were like, you know, they, they seem to have spent quite a bit of money, um, a certain, you know, certain premium on, on a number of these companies. Um, and, you know, Cisco tends to, to buy a lot of companies. That's, that's sort of their, their innovation pattern. And then they put them back together. Um, so in essence, HyperShield is this, you know, big, all-encompassing um, kind of, like you said, security meets AI thing. So their their, their thing was basically uh, the 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 pitch of it is you no longer, you know, given the pace um, at, at which things are are evolving, uh, people are working in all sorts of places. Data is coming into your business and out of your business in all sorts of different ways. There's no longer sort of just a you know, a moat around the business, um, you know, you no longer can kind of just rely on firewall rules and, and other sort of static security. And their whole pitch is this big, you know, very, very big, very involved, um, very data centric uh, security architecture that now is going to leverage somehow um, AI to sort of be looking at all this data, log data from folks like Splunk and uh, sort of traffic shaped or monitored data from eBPF, which is like really low level packet capturing um, and sort of be this uber dynamic security thing. So I, I suspect, you know, from, from the early speculation that I saw from people, it's, you know, a, a huge vision that has a long way to go, but it will be interesting to see, um, you know, how much this, you know, becomes a, a, a talked about point or if it's just a, a point in time announcement. But, um, you know, Cisco, Cisco made it out as if it was a, a really, really big deal and, and kind of brought together, you know, four or five different acquisitions to sort of pull this architecture together. So it'll be interesting to watch over time. Maybe we have Cisco on the show to kind of dive into it more. Um, just because yeah. again, it, it seems, it seems robust in, in theory and, and complex in, in execution. So we'll see what, uh, what happens. Sounds good. And let's go on to the next uh, one, man. Yeah. Let's talk about, friend. let's talk about hype rounds, right? Yeah. 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 Our friend over at, uh, at, uh, cloud of judgment, uh, wrote a really good, um, uh, jam and ball. Our friend jam and ball, uh, wrote a really good thing as he does every, every week, I think, or every couple of weeks on cloud of judgment about hype rounds. What did you take from hype rounds? Cause I think he's, he's really kind of digging into, uh, you know, kind of realities of VC funding versus sort of, um, I guess hype, but also just yeah. like, you know, how do you speculate on what's in between these rounds? Well, I, here's the thing, you know, it's, it, it's always, it's the classic, like something isn't something till you give it a name sometimes. Yep. Um, and maybe you were familiar with the term previously, but I was not familiar with the term previously, this whole concept of hype round. So what, what does that mean? Well, and we've seen this many, many times in the industry. And of course, we're seeing it with the AI, a lot of the AI companies right now, this whole concept of you're raising, a, you know, another round and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever, and you've got a, I don't know, $3 billion valuation or a $5 billion valuation. And a lot of these rounds just tend to be hype, right? Like it is rare these days for those companies to then necessarily exit at something like that. And it's something that's been going on in the industry for a long time. Um, but it was good for me as I read it to like understand it and then also like go, okay, gotcha. I, I see what's kind of going on here. I, but here, so here's my question. So I, I'm, I'm a little like you, we, we've been covering this space for a long time. We've had VCs on this show. We've, we've been doing this 
throughout the entire sort of what they're, you know, Silicon Valley is now calling ZERP or, you know, the, the zero interest rate, you know, period. Uh, do you ever recall people talking about a hype round? I, I, I you know, yeah. I, I remember them talking about like, hey, this company became a unicorn or or whatever. And there was times when we looked at when we looked at rounds and we were like, boy, that seems like a lot of money for not needing it. Right. There's, there, you know, that we've seen lots of, VC, you know, lots of CEOs who have sort of made the bold claim of like, well, we just took this money because uh, we, you know, because we could. But it, this feels like a new term that they're trying to apply for some other, you know, essentially like, I don't know, like it, it seems, it, it seems like they're, they're applying a term for maybe just bad spending or, you know, lack of accountability. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I've never yeah. heard this term before. I don't know where it no, came from. No, I didn't either. I didn't um, either. Um, so, and maybe Jem and maybe Jem made it up. I, I don't know that, but maybe. I mean, I don't know if he gets credit if if that if it holds if he he gets to be the background yeah. guy. But but yeah, it, but it's one of those like it's like yeah, I saw it many times over, but I just never had a name to it. Right, and it's good to have a name to it. But I mean, I, I won't name names. But you and I, there's been some companies that you know grow really, really big and get funding round after funding round, and the valuation just keeps going up and up and you know, we've always kind of said on the podcast, it's a little bit of like, follow the money. Like yeah. what's the business plan? What is it all? What's the, and we're like, how are they ever going to make money? Right. Right. I mean, it, it almost, it, it almost feels like one of those, I mean, again, I, I have to go back and read the article because I, I don't know kind of where he's, where he's putting the onus on, on hype coming from. I assume it's from the VC community as opposed to the, the end customer, you know, the, the company, but maybe it's the other way around, but it does feel a little bit like, uh, the VC community sort of going, well, we just spent a decade throwing extra money at our companies in ways that put them in really, really bad, you know, in, in a position to, yes, you could grow rapidly, but we also put them in a really bad position in terms of like the leverage they had, their ability to, you know, really grow in a, in a normal pace. And now yeah. they're just sort of I don't know. It, it, it just seems like a, one of those weird VC things where they're trying to justify, uh, you know, a, a way of doing stuff that that really wasn't beneficial for the for the company, but maybe was beneficial for them to sort of convince the industry that, like, yes, we, we really think there's a lot going on in this space. Yeah. Well, and and last last point before we jump to our AI speed round. Um, I read it. I read recently. It was maybe a TechCrunch article. I'll, I'll go find it. It's in one of the millions of links in the the deep dive, you know, yep. weeklies. Um, but there was one about basically this whole idea that down rounds are aren't bad anymore. Okay. Um, and you know, and and so for those that are, that aren't familiar with it, so you know, like up until now, well, I should say up until very recently, like you know. It, it, a startup taking a down round, meaning they took more money, but the valuation went down. Right, um, was kind of a kiss of death. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and you and I had been predicting this with the markets being the way they are and everything that's going on. A lot of companies are going to take down rounds just to survive. Um, well, now there's starting to be some press coverage of like, well, maybe that's not a bad thing. Like, maybe that's just a right sizing, or maybe that's just a you know, it is almost like a the hype round, the pendulum coming back, swinging back the other way. And they were like, you know, it's not a bad thing because they're still in business and they're still taking money and, you know, they're well, still trying to get to the exit. And I was like, oh. yeah, I mean, I, I could, I, I could see this on, on a couple of different levels, right? On, on one level you go, okay. Um, yes. If, if the business is still somewhat viable, they just haven't grown at the pace you wanted them to, um, yes, there's some quote unquote shame in taking a down round because you, you're sort of acknowledging that you didn't meet the previous expectations, but again, the expectations might've been too high. Uh, but, but at the same time, it, it could also be, you know, the VC community going like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try and get the press talking about this as if th these aren't such bad things. But what we're really doing is we're saying, well, we can't get into the AI space because those those costs are so high. Those entry points are so high. If we could refund some of these companies that we had previously made unicorns in a C round, D round, E round, keep them alive, keep them on life support, or maybe you know keep them reasonably alive, they become very interesting targets for PE, right? So this does feel a little bit like they're playing the media in an effort to potentially 
you know, yeah. hype up, you know, hype something that for PE to pick up or, you know, or, you know, a, an Oracle or a Google or somebody to sort of pick them up at 50 cents on the dollar as opposed to 10 cents on the dollar or something. Yep. I agree. So, anyways. Um, so we've got a, we've got a section we always do uh, now we call uh, AI speed round or, you know, AI in that space. I tried to lump these things together so they'd be a little easier to kind of go through. Um, the first, the first sort of chunk we have here is all about, uh, LLM. So you want to run through real quick, uh, all of the LLMs that have come out or even SLMs. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, it's, month. it's become impossible to, to talk about all of the LLMs because right. it's literally a new one almost every day. And it's become like, I actually listed something in the, in the weeklies of, of, of like, does this even matter anymore? But here's yeah. some of the highlights, right? Meta Llama 3 came out. Apple released um, a pretty interesting LLM, but we're going to call it a small LLM, yeah. which is something now is a term we've, we've talked about on the show once or twice, but, and then Microsoft releases, I think you say it Phi three, yeah. um, which is an SLM. So a small language model, but the performance is really matching LLMs. Um, but, but I'll say this real quick, like this whole concept of like, what's an LLM, what's an SLM, how do they perform? Does do they perform as well as each other? Do they perform like you know like in certain instances? Like it's really getting to be an interesting space, but also too, it's so crowded. Yeah. And like it's just gonna be crazy going yeah, forward. It's, so that's that's kind of one batch, the the LLM. Yeah, it does uh, it does yeah. feel like in the LLM space, like there's there's a couple things that they're bouncing around in my head without getting into all the technical details. One of them is like uh you know, they they come out you hear some number attached to all of them. Oh, it's a 7B model. It's been trained on a trillion, uh, you know, objects. It's a 34B model. It's a whatever. At some point, you're like, I know those numbers matter, but at some point, do they just become like like the megapixels on your camera? You just sort of go like, right. oh, yeah, okay. It just keeps getting better. It's whatever. The second thing I'm wondering is like, you know, we, we just saw a bunch here in April, like, are we going to start to see sort of that old Intel kind of TikTok thing where it's like, okay, the odd months are going to have like a, a big announcement and the even months are going to be like some iteration thing. Is it going to be like on a three month cycle, a four month cycle? Like, I'm kind of curious to see how that starts to shake out, um, yeah. you know, and then just, you know, is there, is there any way for anybody who's not a super long time hardcore data scientist to figure out like which which one of these models should I be picking? Like, do I am I okay picking one today, or am I going to constantly have buyer's remorse that that one comes out tomorrow that I gotta I gotta switch to? Um, I think that's going to be sort of interesting, and I, and I suspect over time it'll sort of get to be like you know, oh well, I bought a laptop and I'm just going to live with it for two or three right. years because I can't <laughs> afford to get another laptop. But I'm curious how that psychology is going to shake out yeah i think and here, here's what i think we're we're very quickly reaching that point i've heard this new, numerous times on other like ai podcasts i listen to basically the the quality standard these these days is gpt4 like you know yep. if it's gpt4 or better it's good enough and if it's under gpt4 it tends to be well it needs to be specialized or it needs to have something you yeah. know, extra. And so I think everyone, it's almost like, eh, if it's GPT-4 or better, it's good enough. Yeah. Is I think yeah. going to be the yeah. benchmark. Going yeah. I've seen that. I've at seen, least for a little while. Yeah. I've seen that. So. I've seen GPT-3 turbo sometimes because, you know, at a price point or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Next, next. Let's back. talk about chips and, and yeah. acqu acquisitions. Chips and money. Well. Yeah. yeah. Chips ahead. and money. That's a good Go way ahead. to talk Go about ahead. it. Chips and, money. chips and money. Chips and money. Yeah. So Intel, Intel jumped back in. They have their Gaudi 3 chip that is supposed to be both faster than NVIDIA and uses less power. Um, and by the way, um, the, I mean, the chip wars are in, in full strength, right? Everyone yep. is trying to beat NVIDIA. And don't get me wrong. This is a good thing because NVIDIA has great tech. They're making a ton of money. So of course, everyone's going to go after the market. But also, too, they have such supply chain demands. I mean, everything is just going to keep getting right. both faster and less power hungry, hopefully. Yeah. Right? So, I, so I think there's a big market for it. Yeah. Just I, I think for the for the industry in general and us not necessarily like, you know, taking aside any of this or, or being cheerleaders or anything. I mean, it's it, it's never we, we've never seen sort of, you know, a, a giant singular monopoly be great for the industry as a whole. I mean, it's, you know, it's great if you 
or a NVIDIA shareholder or employee probably. But um, so it's good to see Intel, you know, uh, you know, coming out and, and making new advances. It'll be good to see AMD do the same thing. It'll be good to see what ARM can do and, and all sorts of stuff. Because, yeah, it's between supply chain and sort of, you know, monopolistic tie ups or proprietary tie ups. You, you do want to see more options in the in the industry. It's always been proven to be a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Now um, let's talk money, though. Um, lots of perplexity money, lots of acquisitions. Yeah, perplexity raised two hundred fifty million at a two and a half billion to three billion valuation. Uh, Datastax acquired uh, Langflow, um, and Nvidia acquires Run AI, and that one's noticeable. Be uh, notable. Well, Cloudcast alone, but yeah. seven hundred million. I was a yeah. little surprised at uh, you know going for seven hundred million. Yeah. Um, so quick, quick so, summary. Quick summary of some of these. Perplexity is uh, essentially sort of an AI search engine, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's sort of the, the new darling of Silicon Valley, um, in terms of like, you know, will this be, will this, will this be what it looks like to disrupt Google in terms of search, yeah. um, data stacks, uh, you know, for a long time, you know, just a, I want to say just a, but you know, one of those, one of those companies that lived in the sort of data lake data, um, you know, big data sort of space, uh, has been making a bunch of acquisitions lately around AI. So, um, Langflow being, Think of it sort of as like almost like middleware or, um, you know, something along those lines. It's sort of linking between applications, between agents. Um, they are sort of providing an interface on top of, I think it's Langchain. Uh, this is the, this is the core yeah, technology. That's right. Actually, that's something Mark Hinkle mentioned to us so people can go back and listen to that. And then, uh, yeah, Run AI, $700 million for Run AI. I guess they... You know, we had them on, I think about, about a year or so, uh, I put a link to our, in our Twitter to them. Um, essentially they, they sort of live on top of Kubernetes and they are a, you know, AI, uh, GPU scheduling, uh, tool for that. So, you know, $700 million sounds like a lot of money, but I guess if we put it in perspective, um, there had been a couple of Kubernetes companies. So Joe Beta and, and Craig McLucky's company, I forget what the name of them was, that VMware bought. That was around six or seven hundred million. Uh, Rancher got yeah. bought for six hundred or so million. So, you know, anything sort of on top of the Kubernetes space, I guess, you know, six five six hundred million isn't that out of whack. And then, you know, given um, you know what Nvidia is trying to do in terms of just being really efficient, uh, you know, whether it's for their cloud or for something else, um, you know, given the stock price, like seven hundred million, while it sound may sound high, it probably doesn't seem like too much of a drop in the bucket for them these days. Yeah, and I will say this is. Um because I've I've worked with a bunch of the Nvidia architectures and and I will say this like it was a a noticeable hole in their portfolio and their mm -hmm. software stack and yeah. so I mean kudos to them because I do think um, the Run AI was the the best one in that space and they noticed a hole and they filled it so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. congrats. Interesting for uh, for for the the run AI leader to be be one of what is it fifty four direct reports to uh, to Jensen Wong probably. <laughs> yeah, when you're at when you're at fifty three, what's fifty four? That's right, no big deal. That's right. It's just that uh, one more person to add to the to the CC list. Um, all the next stuff in our list is all chunked together because it all has to do with either Google or Google Cloud. So I'll, I'll run yep. through these real quick. Um, we're we're probably running sort of long, so we won't get into all of them. Uh, Google, at least on the consumer side, announced a huge reorganization of both the, the Google, um, sort of AI team. So it wasn't Google brain. It was Google, uh, the other, the other really big one internally, um, but aligned like pixel photos, um, kind of all the consumer -y stuff that they're trying to embed AI into. They, they brought all those all together. So this was, this was sort of the, you know, the big thing of Google reorganizing, a lot of their consumer facing assets and, and properties and, and services around um, AI and around not having these disparate teams trying to figure out the user interface versus, you know, the data and so forth. So that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, and then there's a bunch of links to the Google cloud conference. So Google cloud next, I believe they still call it. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of, lots of announcements. Um, everything was AI. Uh, some of it very interesting. Some of it, in the very googly way of you know doing stuff like showing you the 12 different ways that they could figure out how to help you find an orthodontist assuming your kid doesn't have any friends your wife or spouse doesn't <laughs> know anybody you get no ads but like you're going to use google to help you find an ortho you know so there was there was some of those yeah. weird google things where google does stuff where you're like oh you don't interact with people but you could really make it interesting with technology so 
lots of stuff in there, but you know, also a lot of very, very interesting stuff, Gemini uh, 1.5 stuff and, and some other enterprise yeah. stuff. So I will say this r- real quick, and I think this is a trend we're all, already seeing it at Google, and I think you're starting to see it at Microsoft as well. I can't really comment on AWS as much, but I mean, I think everyone like, hey, we're going to put AI in everything. We're going to put an AI, AI in the consumer products. We're going to put AI yep. in the enterprise products. Yep. And the next thing you know, there's you know ten co-pilots floating around internally because right. everyone built their own. And then at some point, they all they have to consolidate and make sense of their their own portfolio, more or less yeah. the rest of yeah. the market. They, they just start to confuse everyone trying to be first to market. Yeah. And just to, just to put this in perspective for anybody that doesn't think that stuff sort of happens. Uh, when I was at Cisco years and years ago, we did voice over IP. Uh, we worked on a technology called SIP, SIP. Um, eventually we had 16 different SIP stacks within the company working on different products that were all slightly different. And they all, you know, while they all use the standard, they all use different APIs and different implementations. So it can happen in the smallest of companies and the biggest of companies. Let's, uh, let's, let's jump ahead to, to a couple of the trends that we always do at sort of the, the end of these shows. Uh, we're at about the 30 minute mark. We'll try and bang through these fairly quickly. Um, we've got three trends this week. Um, you want to hit on the first one? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first trend is really, and I think it's just a continuation of 2024 is a really big year for just announcements, right? Lots of acquisitions, lots of new models, lots of talking about investments. And it, it's interesting to me because like, you know, if you kind of follow the traditional S curves of of pretty much all markets and categories kinds of things, right? Like it is interesting to me of like, we are definitely in the boom year. Of, of everything, right? Like, you know, o- OpenAI kind of changed the world with ChatGPT in late 2022. And then everyone kind of recognized that and picked their head up and was like, oh, wow, there's a new thing. Let's go chase that. And and guess what? It You know, it takes a certain amount of time to get things funded and get things built and get things brought to market. And we are right in the middle of that. We're almost at probably peak hype, if it will. If yeah. you will. And I, th- I think the trough of disillusionment is, is going to be the, the next macro trend, right? But, but for now we're, we're definitely in the boom time. Right yeah. Now. No. And well, I mean, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of money that, that was still around in companies from, from after COVID and so forth. You've got these, these new sort of big trends that are happening and, and, and you've got, um, you know, companies that are, that are looking across the table or across the marketplace and we used to have, you know, a big announcement every you know, six months or 12 months from your biggest competitor, maybe, you know, maybe every five or six months. And it feels like it's, you know, you look across the table at w- in whatever part of the, the industry you're in. And again, this could be technology, but it could also be in automotive. It could be in you know, pharmaceuticals. And, and everybody feels like they're making big announcements and big bets kind of all the time. So it's, it's one of those, it does feel like, um, especially in the tech sector, like it's, it's definitely a hold on to your hat kind of year. Don't be surprised uh, by almost anything. And and some of that feels kind of interesting because we are also, at least here in the U S we are in the middle of an election year, which, you know, people tend to sort of like hold back on making big decisions until, until the election happens. And they sort of have some, some perspective on what they think the next, you know, government will look like, but people, people in the tech industry aren't holding back at all. So yeah, don't, don't be surprised by, by any announcement that you see on a, on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday, because uh, people are, I don't want to say like afraid of missing out, but I mean, there's definitely people pushing, pushing a lot of money on the table in terms of, uh, you know, we, we're going to make big bets. We're not making small bets. And those could be, like you said, acquisitions or, or anything. Yeah. Well, I'll add one more trend that I'm seeing too, though, is, um, and I'll call out two instances in particular. Um, the, companies want to make sure if somebody else announces something, they're going to announce something too. Sometimes yep. even if that isn't finished, right? So oh, Google yeah. Gemini caught a lot of shit for, um, you know, announcing some of their things and kind of faking their demo and stuff wasn't released yet and really borderline getting over their skis. And then OpenAI, um, 
they were in the early days kind of known for like, hey, here's an announcement. And oh, by the way, the product's there now. And and just having an incredible release velocity. But even now with the last couple of announcements, it's like, oh, yes, we're absolutely doing that. But it's coming later this year. Or right. we're absolutely right. doing that, but it's still in beta. So you're starting to also see the rate of announcements outstrip the velocity of the products. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think the other thing that we're going to start to see, and we'll get into this, maybe we'll just jump into the next trend is we are starting to see some early reality set in with AI. Um, you know, we had a, we had something in our notes, uh, that we didn't really get to. Um, so, you know, an example of that is like stability AI, who was one of the companies who was doing really cool stuff on the graphic side of things. So helping to, you know, like generate me a picture of whatever, you know, starting to get people thinking about like, oh, this is going to impact Hollywood and, and other creators. Um, basically ran out of money, basically, you know, was not taking in enough money, uh, realized that their their AI bill with folks like AWS and others was, you know, I think they're a hundred million dollars behind or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so I think we're going to see some some realities of, you know, hype versus business models and, and AI chews up so much money so fast that we won't have these long, you know, two, th- you know, four, five, six, seven year companies. We might see a lot of 18 month companies. Um, you know, kind of burn through some stuff. Um, and, and I think, you know, the other reality we're going to see is I think people are realizing you can't fake your demos the way that you could six months ago, even. Agreed. Right? Um, Agreed. People are, people are getting very, very smart about being like, that's not possible. You can't do that today. How much of that was faked? Um, but like you said, they're, they're sort of offsetting that with, uh, well, it's, it'll be here, but it'll be here in six months as opposed to being like, look at, look at what, what we just did with this, this latest thing and this latest demo. Yep. Agreed. Last thing I had on here as we, as we sort of wrap this up, uh, a lot of things I feel like, um, and again, this is, this is probably enterprise centric. I know you and I sort of live in the sort of enterprise part of tech. Um, I feel like there's probably a lot going on, but a lot of things are being lost between, sort of the, the yin and yang for every enterprise uh, organization, every enterprise CIO between what they're dealing with, uh, you know, their, their future with Broadcom VMware, since that's a, a big part of their bill, big, big part of their infrastructure, big part of how they build applications and the AI discussions. And, and I feel like every conversation that I see is, is somewhere on either end of that spectrum, but, but very few conversations in between. Are you, are you seeing anything similar? Yeah, no, I, I, it's your, your classical CIO dilemma of like, how much of my, my budget is keeping the lights on and how much of my budget goes towards innovation, right? Right. And, and a, and a good CIO is constantly trying to lever as much as they can towards innovation and pressing ahead. But the problem with that is I think, you know, VMware Broadcom is just one example, but I think there's some other things going on where you're starting to see lots of like the keeping the lights on typically meant steady state. Yeah. Well, now the keeping the lights on isn't steady state. Right. right and, exactly. and so what you're starting to see is a disruption of stuff that's worked for 10 years, 15 years. Now suddenly I got to go potentially swap out some software. I might have to potentially go create a new stack. I might have to, maybe I'm pulling in a digital transformation project or, you know, a going to cloud or going to cloud native. And so what I I think you're seeing more than anything is uh, the quote unquote legacy business is suddenly kind of getting turned on its head. And because it's getting turned on its head, it's causing a lot of disruption. And oh, by the way, we're getting all this pressure to go do all this AI stuff, which is a whole different stack and a whole right. different set of hardware and software. It, honestly, it's it's kind of a shit time to be a CIO. <laughs> it's, like, it's, a very, it's a very, very hard time because yeah, your, your, your budgets are, you know, your, your budget, like you said, you, you, you used to know how to manage your budget. You would have times that you know, things would get a little weird or a little out of, out of whack, but you, you know, you, you had some steady things that you could just trust and you knew were going to work or you, you know, whatever. And, and right now I imagine all of them are sitting there going every day feels like you've got this balloon and you're just squeezing one part of the balloon and the other part puffs up. And then two minutes later you squeeze the other part of the balloon and some other part puffs up and you're like, how do I, you know, how do I deal with this thing? Because I've got uncertainty on the AI side, but all this sort of demand and, and hope and build up 
on the infrastructure side of things or the legacy or the green, you know, the, the, you know, heritage side of what do they call it heritage side these days. Um, oh, okay. To, I had not heard that. I've, I've heard people call, I've heard people call legacy something else. I think I want to say they call it heritage. It, it's a hipster kind of word to say like, Oh, it's still really, <laughs> it's, it's still the, really it's important. The, it's not old and it's not old and dusty. Um, it's the sipping your sipping your own champagne versus eating your dog food or right, whatever it right, is, right? right. right. Like, um, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, like you have to be paying attention to that space because you know the bill might be five x or three x or two x or seven x or whatever it might be. And um, so yeah, you it, it, there's got to be a lot of interesting conversations as a CIO these days in terms of what it's the next six months going to look like, what's the next year going to look like, um, you know the economy is, you know, kind of stabilized to where they probably have a pretty good sense of things or it feels like they have a sense of things. But uh, yeah, I, I feel bad for for anybody who is working on stuff that is in between those ends of the spectrum, because right now you are getting so little attention, so little headlines, so little visibility, so little sunlight um, that it's got to be sort of weird to be to be in that space right now. Agreed. All right, man. Well, that was April. Uh, I think, uh, as far as I know, as far as you have told me, you are likely going to be out for the the the, uh, the May news of the month. So we're gonna we're gonna have to try and find yeah. a backup because you're gonna be traveling a whole bunch. Yeah, I'm I'm pulling a Brian. Um, I'm going to be gone almost the whole month of May. I think I'm home six days. Nice. The whole I'm month of May. Coming, I'm not coming to mow your grass, so you got to. Find <laughs> I mean, it's a combination of of professional travel and and personal travel, but but yeah, I'm I'm seriously gone the the whole month, and I yeah, I was looking ahead because we, we you know f- fortunately we are scheduling out a, a good bit again, and we you know we're managing all of that, and I kind of looked at the show sh- schedule the other day, and I was like, oh yeah, oh no, wait a second, I am not going to be here for that. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So uh, just just one small heads up in that sense, we do uh, we Aaron has been very, very diligent to make sure we will have shows, I think literally booked out. You've already booked them out and we may have recorded some that are into May and, and maybe even into June. So if we if yeah, we do happen to mess up now, and mention yeah. something that uh, is ahead of schedule or behind schedule, if you're listening to a show in say May and you're like, that sounds like something from April, uh, we apologize for that. We tried not to do that, but uh, it may have may have happened so that Aaron can can uh, live, live his life without being uh, tied to the, to the Cloudcast 24 hours a day. Exactly. Well, listen, man, it's been, it's been a good month. Uh, it seems like it's, it, things are picking up. I was a little worried in February. It was slow. March was starting to pick up and April feels like it's, uh, it's full throttle. Uh, the, the, yep. the industry is back. Things are warmer. Sunshine is out. Uh, that means, uh, tech is, tech is in full, uh, you know, full throttle at this point. So, uh, yeah. good month. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks for listening to us both, uh, on the, on the audio show, as well as hopefully, uh, if, you know, if you're checking it out on the, on the video show, we appreciate that as well. Any, any last thoughts for, uh, for April, man? No, I am really looking forward to May. I think May is going to be, as you said, I feel like it's been a, a nice roll up for the year and February and then March and April, like May is going to be crazy. Yeah. I just yeah, have a feeling. Stuff. All right, folks, with that, we will wrap it up. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks for telling a friend and we will talk to you next month. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 